now joining us, of course, back on the show, folks, ladies and gentlemen. She's three-time National Pitcher of the Year, four-time All-American, got a two-time Olympian, gold medalist, and most recently the uh, the MVP of Athletes Unlimited. She is the GOAT, if you will. Kat Osterman joining us here on In the Circle. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me again. Well, here we are, New Year 2021, and obviously a lot of focus for you will be on the Olympics. I'm kind of curious, how do you feel about where you're at right now as a pitcher compared to where you were a year ago at this time as you thought you were getting ready for the Olympics, what we thought at the time was going to be in the summer of 2020? Yeah, um, I think now I'm in a much better place, to be honest. Um, I found a, a groove um, at Athletes Unlimited. I gained more confidence than I had um, when we broke in March um, and just kind of found, I, I kept saying like, I kind of found myself again. Um, I feel like at Athletes Unlimited, I threw kind of almost vintage cat, what I, how I felt I was throwing at 27, 28, 29. Um, and I hadn't felt that um, with the national team yet since I'm retiring. So um, I'm in a really good place. I feel a lot better physically and mentally, um, ready to compete. I think that was the other piece um, a year ago. I still only had, you know, the summer of 19 as far as competition goes under my belt. And so the competing piece was still um, something I needed in in-game pressure situation. So I've got that now and I feel really good. Some, some days I forget that I unretired <laughs> or I retired somewhere in the middle of it because I feel like I've, I've been throwing again for a while. You mentioned Athletes Unlimited, that schedule, routine, knowing you, could, you were going to pitch every week. Uh, was that a big part of it too, that there wasn't like, Hey, we're going to play here. And then it might be a few weeks or, you know, that tour obviously got shut down in March, like the rest of the world with everything that was going on. So there was always disruptions, even like when you came back in 2019, there was the tournament and then there was time off and then you're traveling. You didn't have a consistent routine like you did at Athletes Unlimited. Was that a big part of that? Um, I think so. I mean, Athletes Unlimited was very structured. We knew what we were, you know, what our days looked like, um, knew when you could get your lifts in, your conditioning in all around your practice time. And um, yeah, obviously, um, first week I was on Jesse Warren's team. And so her and I talked about what, where I was at pitching wise and how much I could throw. And then um, after that, obviously I was a captain. And so I kind of controlled my own destiny, but just knowing what practice looked like and what I needed and just, yeah, I was able to get in a routine and and do what I needed to do um, specifically for my pitching. But, um, you know, the game situations, some were planned, some weren't. Um, obviously, week two, the plan was not to throw in all three games, but it was necessary for us to win. And um, there's some funny stories that go with that. But that was, you know, I was even hesitant when I went in into game two um, until Randy Rapp yelled at me. And I think that's the only time in her life she's ever yelled back at me. So, um but it was, it was fun. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think just being able to throw as much as I did really helped me. You went 13 and one, 95 strikeouts. You scored 2,408 points in their point system to be the inaugural uh, individual you know, championship there. You were the standout athlete, the athletes unlimited champion. What does that mean to you to win that coveted deal? You were like the top player. You were captain every week. You took it very seriously because you were like, you had a strategy. You were, you were all over the place there as far as that was concerned, but you won. What does that mean to you to be on top there? And I, we had a bunch of players on from, and they were like, man, can't, she still got it. They're like just in awe of seeing you there. You know, it's, it's interesting. It's the silver lining of 2020, to be honest. Um, obviously when I first ever heard of the idea of athletes unlimited, there was no shot in my mind. I was going to be playing because Olympics were going to be over. I was going to, be done moving on and um with the postponement it made me have to figure out you know okay how can I how can I keep doing keep training keep sharpening my skills do everything I need to do and so the opportunity was amazing um I went in just trying to you know really with the mindset of let's go in let's compete let's figure out you know the best way for you to be an effect as, as effective as possible um not really expecting and or putting pressure on myself to to win um obviously when i'm in game situations you want to win but i didn't go in and you know be like oh i'm just gonna all of a sudden you know i'm, I'm gonna go in and all these kids have been playing for years now and i was unretired i was retired and um i'm gonna take the top spot but i did want to compete i wanted to be in the top 10 um obviously goal with top four to be a captain and 
um, really as the weeks unfold, I just felt like I got stronger and stronger. Um, and so, you know, it means a lot to, to come out on top, especially being the oldest player there. Um, for me personally, it, it was kind of one of the few, and I think because it is somewhat individualistic, um, obviously we win, we get points with our team wins and inning wins and stuff like that. Um, but for me, I executed on the pitching side, but I almost had more fun executing on the draft and putting a lineup together and pinch hitters and, and this and that. And um, since Athletes Unlimited has put the games on YouTube and watching, I laugh because Eric Collins and Danielle Lawry, a lot of times are like, oh, Kat made a great move there. And it's like, sometimes it's a bit of luck. You, you make a change and you cross your fingers, it's going to work. But um, having coached, it was just fun to kind of do all facets of the game at the same time, which, you know, a lot of people are like, why are you coaching first when you're not pitching? Or even when you are pitching, aren't you tired? And I'm like, someone's got to be over here. And I don't really want the hitters over here because I want them to be able to focus on what they're supposed to be doing. So um, it was a fun, uh, a fun six weeks, um, an experience that changed, I think all of us, but I got to meet and run into quite a few, you know, athletes that I never would have crossed paths with if I hadn't done it. Um, and then, yeah, um, you know, being the champion was, it was a great feeling. It was a great moment. Um, but you know what, like it doesn't, it doesn't trump the whole six weeks of the experience by any means. Like the whole experience was so amazing that, you know, winning was just kind of the little cherry on top. You mentioned that you were at first base coaching and you were into it. Uh, and you mentioned the draft and, and I mean, just take me through those juices. I didn't even know. I mean, you ever been at first base? I think you mentioned you had done first base before, but what was that like, obviously, being at first base coach? What was it that got you uh, – it seemed like your juices really went up a different level about this, that you got – you were not only just a pitcher, you were able to do a lot of different things within Athletes Unlimited. Yeah, so um, I actually did coach first base when I coached it to Paul. Um, Liz Jagowski was pregnant when I got there, so she didn't coach first, so I did. And then when I coached D2, there's obviously only two of us coaching, so I had to coach first base there as well. So I've done it before. Um, and I actually didn't realize how much I missed it until I got back over there at Athletes Unlimited. Um, and just being able to to see balls when they're hit and let hitters know, you know, whether they're going or not. Even if they don't hear me, I feel like they do. And I feel like I add energy to it by yelling at them, you know, go or look three or whatever it is. Um, but it just keeps me in the game some. And then when I'm not pitching, I love it because I can watch the other pitcher um, a little more intently and try to figure out if there's patterns or things like that. So um, it was fun. Um, coaching first is, I, there were a couple of times people were like, you need to go, you need to go sit down. Like it's getting in the sixth inning. You need to run. I'm like, I'm fine. I promise. Like I'll, I'm good. Um, and then the draft is, uh, I think the drafting was just more of me kind of putting the coaching hat on and making a lineup, so to speak. Um, you know, you, we can consult with whoever we want, whether they're in AU or not. Um, and I didn't do too much. Uh, occasionally I would, I would call some people, but for the most part, um, obviously, since I drafted Gwen with my first pick, her and I would would talk a lot um, and try to put together a team um, or our ideas. Um, and then making the lineup was most of the time I felt like pretty easy, but um, at the same time, it's just uh, it was just an incredible experience and fun all the way around. And I think, you know, me coaching um, was a benefit too. Like when Jesse Warren chose in week one she picked me first and she's like, Hey, you've coached before you take it from here. And I was like, wait, this is your team. Um, but she did. And she, she relied a lot on me coaching to help her put together a lineup and who we should pick and things like that. So um, it was fun. It was a lot of fun and a lot of strategy that um, I'm not sure everyone was ready um, to have to implement. You mentioned Gwen. That was kind of the, the, the anti, you know, it seemed like every week everybody, everybody would ask you, oh, what are you going to do? And it was pretty obvious. Yeah, I'm going to take Gwen. <laughs> the pick, obviously you two hit it off. You clicked. What mm -hmm. was it that now you've had time to think, what was it about Gwen and her catching style that you two just automatically clicked there? Because obviously uh, there was good chemistry there to the point where you made it very priority to try to get her every time when you were captain. Yeah, um, from the first bullpen we threw, um, just her nature of conversation, keeping it light, but still serious. Like, you know, I would throw, you know, my first rise blade through to her and, you know, she noticed the spin and she noticed the break and um, she'd start asking questions about, okay, do you like to pair this with your drop? Do you pair this with your, you know, like just strategy questions, but just how she had conversation. And then the more we were around each other and I've told her this, 
she, she reminded me of Megan Willis as far as just the conversations we were having, um, the ease with, you know, how she works behind the plate. Um, and then eventually once we got into calling pitches um, for games and I watched how she, she just, she worked with me well to paint a picture. Um, it's not a dead set, like, okay, we always do this, this, and this. Um, she just worked with kind of, okay, what's working this day? What do we know about this hitter? What do I know Kat likes to throw to these kind of hitters? And um, it just, it was easy. Um, I can't, there's not one thing, but she reminded me a lot of Megan and I told her that. And um, it was just easy to get in a rhythm with her. And we both talk. So like, we talk throughout the entire game. And when she walks out towards the mound, like a couple words here and there, and then we go back and throw and then a couple words here. It's just, and it's not necessarily serious talking. Occasionally it is. It's like, hey, I need to hit this corner or hey, I need you to trust this. But sometimes it's just like, hey, you got it. You're, you're looking good. And yeah, and occasionally it's like, hey, where are we going after dinner for dinner after this? Um, not usually that conversation, but sometimes. You never know what comes out of my mouth. But it was just an ease and a comfort that um, happened really fast. And um, yeah, I, I felt good with it. And I, I, I realized that that comfort and that um, kind of calming presence I had was really helping me throw well. And so I wanted to duplicate that as much as possible for me to get in a good spot going forward into the Olympics. And so, yeah, it was important for me to, to stay in that realm. So I kept picking her. And um, after week four, after that last game in week four, I, we were walking out together and I said, hey, I need to talk to you. And she goes, oh, no, I know. Go pick your pitcher tomorrow. <laughs> I was like, okay, as long as you know. Um, and thankfully, she was still around uh, in the second or third round when I grabbed her. Yeah, which I was blown away when that happened. I'm like, you know that that's going to ha- – like, take her away if you want to kind of be competitive there. But uh, Well, I think the thing that worked in our favor there is because I had had her for the first four weeks. So no one else had thrown to her, so everyone else had started to get comfortable <laughs> with other people. Ah, so it worked so out in my favor. There you go. That's interesting. I didn't think of it that way. Um, but you mentioned Megan Willis. We had her on this podcast. There you, that's good. I like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we had Megan on, she talked about the relationship you two developed at Texas and the trust and how that's so pivotal in a catcher pitcher relationship that you made her a better catcher because you would talk to her, but she felt like she made you a better player because she would tell you what she sees and what's working and what's not, where sometimes catchers or maybe, maybe some don't communicate that with their pitchers. And just talk about that relationship. Cause I would imagine as there's things you've picked up, and having all the catchers you've had, you've had a lot of great catchers throughout your career that you can go up to Gwen or a Deja with Team USA and say, hey, this is kind of what I'm noticing. This is kind of what, you know, I'd like to do and have open communication with the catchers. Yeah, so Megan and I were so far opposite ends of the spectrum personality-wise. So if you had met us individually, there's no way you would have thought like, oh yeah, those two are going to work great together. Um, but it did from day one. Um, and she's never been shy about being honest and truthful with people. And, um, the second she decided, you know, the second she was like, eh, that was, I mean, good spot, but it didn't move a lot. Or I've seen you throw it better. I was, I was kind of like, all right. Okay. Challenge accepted. Um, but then the more we worked together, I really enjoyed it because I'm a perfectionist as is when I'm in the circle. And so if you're going to tell me that you've seen me throw it better then I want, then I want to throw it better as much as I can, obviously. And to have a catcher that not just sits back there and catches, but learns what your pitch is supposed to look like. And then over time, she would watch my body and she may not verbalize um, the right words all the time, but she'll be like, okay, I don't, I don't know how to tell you what you're doing wrong, but this is what I see. And she'd kind of reenact it. And I'm like, okay, I hear you. And so to have a catcher that really invested in her pitcher, wanting to see how I threw things, how it moved, where could we spot it to where she could still work and get it called for a strike? Um, and then conversation with me and her was always easy. Um, and, you know, I tell catchers out, like, I'm not going to be offended if you tell me something doesn't move. I mean, there have been times I think something moves and Megan says it doesn't. And I just kind of shrug my shoulders and keep going. I'm not going to sit and argue it. You caught it. I saw it, but whatever. <laughs> I mean, if it's in a game, it gets hit or it doesn't. And we have to go to the next pitch anyways. Um, but uh I tell catchers all the time, you're not going to hurt my, my feelings if you tell me something doesn't move. Um, and I've actually done the same thing lately. I've been thrown to a, a junior in high school, and um, she's a very good personality behind the plate. And uh, 
one of the first times she was like, um, that one didn't move as much. And I said, okay. And she looked at me and I'm like, she goes, is that okay? I'm like, dude, if it doesn't move, tell me it doesn't move. I don't want to th keep throwing it thinking it's moving right. it good if it's not. Um, so just being a pitcher that can, you have to be a little bit of thick skinned to, you know, not take everything so personal. They're not trying to tell you they're a bad pitcher. Just that pitch wasn't as good as what you can do. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I was fortunate and spoiled to throw to Megan for 10 years, I think it was. Um, but that relationship was something that was huge. And yeah, I mean, the trust we built was a matter of, I mean, she would trust when I'd shake off. And sometimes I would have to trust when she threw down the same pitch, even though I shook off. But I'm, and there were, there were times I did. And I was like, all right, it's on you if it doesn't work. And then it worked. And she's like, see, I told you. And I'm like, you're right. You know, we're going to go on. And then there's times where I shake off and what I wanted works. And she's like, all right, I see where you're thinking. Um, but it's just, con it's continuous dialogue. It's not, and I think right. that's where with Gwen and I too, it was continuous all the time um, throughout the game, throughout weeks. Um, like, you know, I think most people noticed starting about week three, I started throwing more rise balls. Well, that was semi-planned um, because it was like, I don't want to show everything right up front if I don't have to. Um, so let's wait until we get to where people have really seen a lot and then we can mix in off speed or rise or whatever it is. And um, we had continuous conversations over that. So the trust, the trust factor with catchers is huge um, as well as it's just, I got almost being honest more than being tr like trust. It's just be straight honest. And I've told, there have been times I've had catchers, um, Kristen Sandberg's one when she was young and first with us, she, I felt like she didn't catch my backdoor curve correctly and we didn't get called. And I'd be like, Hey, Megan doesn't move her glove. She literally sticks it here, catches it and goes like, don't try to go get it. Like just sit there. And if I miss it, I miss it. Like, and she was like, okay. And I'm like, trust me. <laughs> Um, so it's just a matter of having that communication and both sides knowing that you're trying to work together to get the pitch to be as great as it can be. Yeah, Megan even told me now when she watches you pitch, she knows what you're thinking and she could tell if you're on or off your game just because she's caught you so long. She knows every movement of yours and can tell what you're thinking. Uh, does she text you? Does she reach out still and say, hey, this is what I noticed. You know, this is what's all of her. Does she still critique you there uh, from afar? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, um, actually in, uh, 2019 when the U the, the national team was opening up in Chicago against both Chicago and pride or bandits and pride, she was like, Hey, do you know when you're throwing? And I was like, yeah. And so I told her when I was throwing and after the first game, I had like this text, why aren't you doing this? You're doing too much of this. What's wrong with this pitch? Did it like, it was like a novel. And I was like, all right, let's go through this one by one. And so <laughs> then we had a text conversation. She's like, you have to remember why, like what makes you good. And like, yes, you have the movement, but you have to offset it with this and you have to challenge hitters here. And I'm like, you're right. I'm trying not to think right now. I'm trying to just throw and like get back in a group <laughs> of competing, but you're right. Um, and then, yeah, you know, during Athletes Unlimited, she didn't say a whole lot about my pitching, um, but like the game, the one loss I had, I think she was like, you didn't look like yourself. And I had just told her, I was like, yeah, I didn't really, I didn't feel it in warmups. I didn't feel it. I didn't feel good all day, but you know, I was like, tucked it out. Like, let's go. And eventually I kept, I competed as long as I could and got the best of me. And she was like, it happens. And like, it does On to a new day. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll get texts from her and every now and then if I, she hasn't heard from me in a while, she'll, she'll drop a text like, Hey, how's it going? What's going on? Like, is it moving? But she, she has made it known she doesn't really want to get behind the plate anymore. So I don't ask her to catch bullpens. I'm pretty sure if I begged, I could get her back there. But I was going to say, yeah. I, I mean, uh, if, you, if my, I was going to say, if you my husband catches her, now. Yeah, just get her a flight, get her a flight, give her a drive. Like, you know, there's gotta be a way you could get her to catch one more time. I, uh, I had her catch in 18. In June of 18, I went down to Florida and, um, was gonna and she caught a bullpen for me and she actually caught two days in a row I think and after the first day she texted me and was like I can't walk up the stairs and I was like sorry <laughs> that's taking its toll on her uh I doubt she texted yeah. you very much about the one performance that stood out from Athletes Unlimited the night you had 16 strikeouts I remember I asked you on the post game was that the best game you've pitched and thrown and you felt since your comeback and I think you said yes uh 
go, looking back on that performance, was that like the, a point there where you were like, man, I do have everything in my arsenal that I, you know, either used to have or close to where I really want to be. That night right there was a huge, had to be a huge confidence booster. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, we used all four quadrants. We mixed some speeds. Um, I think that's the one game um, a lot of rise balls were thrown, which was especially in crucial situations um, because I know people are looking for drop balls during that time. And so, yeah, we were able to really mix and just talked about using different quadrants that we probably hadn't used as much in the first two weeks. And, um, you know, there's just something about when you get in a groove and just continuing on with it. And I think, I feel like that whole game, like, I don't really remember our offensive side of that game, but I just know that every time we went out, like, I just felt like it was on autopilot almost. You were, you were in the zone. You were in the zone that night. Yeah. And you get in those zones. I mean, I hope athletes understand you don't get in those zones very often. Um, you know, I've been throwing for a long time and like the actual zone zone, like I've probably been in 10, 15 times max, um, probably closer to 10. Um, and so those are the, those are the fun games. And sometimes when you think back, like, you know what you did, but you can't think of what you were thinking about because it was just in the zone and just like, press play and let's go. Yeah, it's just pretty remarkable. You had a lot of fun and I know your focus is on the Olympics and that's your near focus right now. You're not thinking about anything else. But did you have more fun than you thought you would at Athletes Unlimited to the point where if the opportunity presented itself again, you could maybe leave the door open down the road for that? Like, it, did, did that make that big of an impression on you? Because a lot of people, it really came off on TV how much fun you were having. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had more, I hate to say I had more fun than I ever have playing softball, but I really think I did. Um, and, you know, a lot of people noticed it. Um, people who know me were like, we haven't seen you smile in the field that much. Um, my agent has been with me since the day I graduated college was like, I haven't seen you have that much fun in ever, I don't think. And so um, we've talked about it and um, yeah, the door's open. The door's open for sure. Um, and I made that kind of known while I was there that um, because I enjoyed the experience, I was, I was open to the idea of it. Um, it if, if it happens, it'll be one more year. It won't, it won't be continuous. Um, 2021 will be the last time I lay at the light lace at the cleats. Um, it's just determining whether I'm done in August or October. Well, hey, let's talk about that. Cause we thought it'd be done this 2020. Uh, that didn't take place. Take me back to March when everything is starting to shut down. You were in the tour. I think you all were in the West coast at the time. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, the tour has been called off. Co you know, pandemic is starting and everything. Did it, and then now you're thinking to yourself, at what point did you think at all that, oh my goodness, the Olympics not only may not happen this year, but it may not happen, period, and my comeback could be over? Um, so I don't remember the exact, it's March, I want to say like 9th, 10th, 11th, something like that. Um, it was the same day that the NBA had basically- The 11th, um, yeah. Yeah, suspended their play. Um, we had flown to Seattle. Um, we went to our hotel, changed, went to practice. We had been at practice in the Dome at University of Washington. Um, go back to the hotel, get our dinner. And then we were told to meet downstairs. And so we go downstairs and they take us to our bus. I still, I was actually talking to Kelsey Stewart today. I'm like, do we still wonder why we had a team meeting on the bus as opposed to just like in a hotel room somewhere? We'd all been together already, so I don't know. But we get on the bus, and they basically tell us, if you can book a red eye out tonight, book a red eye out. Otherwise, get out first thing in the morning. We're suspending tour um, because, of course, after practice is when we got the news that NBA suspended their play. And so they were like, we're suspending for tour till further notice. Um, so figure, you know, get yourself home. If you, you know, essentially, USA Softball, they're like, we have credit cards if you guys need it. If you use your own, just you know, email us receipt. We'll reimburse you, whatever. So um we all booked flights and and got out of there i think most of us got out of there that night i think like two or three got out the next day um and went home and i think most of us I, i'm speaking for myself but i don't think any of us predicted it to be as long as it was um but again at that point in time we didn't know a whole lot about coronavirus and what was going on you know we just 
we flew to Seattle where there was actually the epicenter because of the um, retirement homes. Um, yep. or, but, um, but you still didn't, we just didn't know. And so I know, I, th- I think we thought, you know, oh, a month, six weeks maybe, and then we'll be back together. And then obviously we get home and just the way everything was, was shutting down and postponing from NBA to NCAA, um, it was like three days at home. And I looked at my husband and I said, the Olympics are going to be postponed. And he was like, you think so? And I'm like, yeah, I think so. And I remember at one point, Monica and I were texting about something. And I think she asked me, you know, what do you think is going to happen? I said, oh, they're going to be postponed. And she was like, you really think so? And I'm like, yeah, they're going to be postponed. There's no way. There's no, I mean, at this point, I think Italy was shut down. And I'm like, those athletes can't train. Right. Other countries are starting to shut down. They can't train. Like, you can't have the Olympics if people literally can't train to be at their best because that's what the Olympics prides themselves on is the best of the best being able to compete at their best. And I was like, and then slowly but surely, you know, gyms and stuff here closed down. I'm like, there's no way. And especially, so then once they postponed it, they just came out and said, you know, it's going to be postponed. They didn't give a date. And then the longer that they waited to give a date, I knew it was going to have to be a longer postponement period because at the same time and I've said in a couple interviews I cannot imagine being an athlete that has to go through a taper like swimming or track I don't know who else does um, because for us we don't have to taper as much as they do but have to taper and have an unknown date like here train but we don't know when your qualifiers right. are going to be we don't know when because we don't know when the Olympics are going to be um, and so thankfully they didn't make us wait, but I think three and a half, maybe four weeks to know that, you know, they were just going to push it back a year. Um, there was a brief moment where I kind of was like, if this gets like straight up canceled, boy, like, did I just make a lot of decisions based on, on this? Um, but I think deep down, I knew they would try to have it at some point, just because I know what the Olympics means to every country. I mean, I've been in it. I know, how much for some people it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for some countries it's a chance for their like one athlete to win a medal um and then i also know how japan prides themselves on what they host so i knew you know they were probably going to push to try to figure out how to make it make it happen um so i didn't doubt too much that it was going to happen at some point um but i also kind of knew i as soon as we got home i just had a gut feeling that it was going to be postponed and um so yeah here we are waiting for July of 2021. When you found out it was going to be July of 2021, what was your reaction? Relief? Uh, I would assume you talked to your family about it because that's an extra year of now all of a sudden, you know, the, the clock has been adjusted here on your kind of your game plan here a little bit, which means from a training standpoint has to be adjusted. Everything has to be adjusted. How, what was that process like once you got the official word, hey, this is now pushed back, but it's another year? Yeah, um, well, when it had been postponed and then rumors were kind of circulating, that it was probably going to be a year. Um, I looked at my husband and I said, it's probably going to be a year of postponement. And he said, all right, we're going to, you got another year. And I, and there have been times, um, not recently, more in the probably the two to three months that followed um, the postponement where I looked at him and I'm like, I can't do this for 13 more months. Like I can't. He was like, yeah, you can. You've done it this long. You can do it again. You can keep doing it. Part of that's just the mental toll of training by yourself all the time. Um, that's where Athletes Unlimited was another good kind of segment in there because you got to go be around people to an extent. Um, and it wasn't just sitting at home and throwing a bullpen on my own, lifting on my own, running on my own, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had a conversation because I, you know, I was like, well, no, another year. So this is, you know, I'm still going to be hodgepodging clinics or lessons or whatever I got going on. Um, to make income when we can at home. And, you know, he just looked at me, he's like, go do what you want to do. Like, this is what you want to do. We, we committed to the long haul and one more year isn't going to hurt us. And I was like, okay. Um, you know, my parents and my brothers support whatever I do. So, um, you know, they were all on board obviously. And at no point did I think, did I even question whether I was going to continue? It was just a matter of what does it look like outside of the time I'm training? Um, because obviously we have bills to pay here at the house. Um, and you know, I did sacrifice my job at Texas state, not solely for the extra year. Um, I kind of already decided I was going to leave, um, before the postponement actually happened. 
Um, but I also think the postponement would have forced my hand there too, because it would have, I would have been hard pressed to be staying on staff and not being able to be there and have to train and, and focus. So, and plus, I mean, it's just hard. Um, I was fortunate that they made it work for the year, the 20, the 19 to 20 um, school year for me, but it's hard to, to train a hundred percent for an Olympic games and be focused on your job. And so um, just, yeah, a lot of sacrifices have been made, but you know what, it's been worth it. There's been some silver linings, as I mentioned, and uh, super excited to kind of just see how 2021 unfolds. Yeah, and as we talked, you know, Team USA, you know, they're trying to sort out how you're going to be preparing for the Olympics. We had Laura Berg on recently, and she admitted, yeah, this is going to be a little different and unique than past Olympics, where you had the tour and you knew you were going to play all these college teams, and there was a schedule. This may not be the case in 2021. What is that going to be like in preparing for the Olympics a little more different than even in the past Olympics that you were a part of? Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be very different. And I think it's going to be hard for a lot of people to deal with or not deal with, but just swallow, um, you know, as athletes, we enjoy going around to different parts of the country and getting to see different fans um, play for them. But obviously for us um, training our safety, our health, making sure that we can get over there um, come July um, with, with no issues is, is a priority. And so, um, you know, right now it sounds like whenever we do train, we're going to be in one spot. We're not going to be traveling around a ton. Um, we're going to, I don't know if games are even on our schedule. I know there's been some talk about possibly playing other international teams versus college teams. Um, but there's so much up in the air, even with colleges, like we don't know who's playing what, are they going to play conference only? Are exhibition games going to be allowed? Um, you know, there's just, it's hard to plan a schedule to be honest and I wouldn't want to be the people having to do that um, when so much is up in the air but it's going to be different um, it's not going to be you know three and a half weeks of, of go going all around the country um, it's going to be probably two maybe three weeks in one place training and we're just going to have to figure out how to make the most of our time together because right now that's that's what we've been missing is time together we as a team as 18 we haven't seen each other since March 11th which is kind of crazy to think about. That is. Wow. I did not. Yeah, that's a great point. It's a long time and it's different than any other U.S. softball teams ever had to deal with uh, for, for sure. Let's go back, though, because you made the team. The last time we had you on here, we talked a lot about your comeback, why you came back. So we're not going to rehash that. People could check out our archives for those interview on that. But we hadn't talked to you since you made the team officially. What was that like making the team last year? Uh, take me through that process because you're you and Monica are one of the few that have gone through the process in the past so you kind of had an idea how it worked but still what is that week like when you tried out and you're now trying to find out waiting for the official word hey I'm on the team plus you're around a bunch of girls that are trying to find out if they're making the team for the first time yeah um we well, you know thankfully the tryout is similar to, or almost identical to every tryout that we do so um I knew exactly, you know, this was, I think, my 12th one. Um, I knew what to expect. Um, I prepared going into it. And to be honest, for the whole week, I, I felt like I threw really well. Um, I just, when we left, when we broke from the last game, I was confident. Um, not because I'm Kat Osterman and I've done this twice, but more because I watched how I played on the field and I was like, I probably threw more consistent than I did at the 19 tryout. And so for me, um, I felt like I had done all I could. Um, and I knew, you know, if for some reason I don't make it, that's their choice. But like, I've done all I can. That was, you know, the best performance I've put together in the last 12 months in, in with USA on my chest. Um, and so I felt confident. And so going into the morning of um, finding out if we make the team or not, they send everyone an email and um, I was actually rooming with Ali Carta and she had told me, she's like, Hey, I'm going to leave in the morning and go drive and get some coffee, sit, be by myself until we get the email. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, but then we get the email and I actually looked for her name first. I saw her name. Then I scrolled down, saw my name and then I text her. But then I'm like reading everyone who all's on the thing. And I'm like, there's, I'm in a hotel room by myself. Like, who do I celebrate with? Then I called my husband, he didn't answer because he was still asleep. Um, <laughs> and then I called my parents and they're like, oh, cool. I'm like, seriously. 
I mean, I guess when that's the third, the third time they're getting this call, they're like, yeah, okay. Like, of course my dad's like, well, I didn't expect you not to make it. I'm like, well, there's still always a chance. Um, but you know, it's, it's one of those, I think having the experience calmed my nerves. Um, I wasn't really nervous opening the email, but again, because I knew I've been through so many tryouts, I also knew that I, I, my performance was good enough. Um, but I think the really cool part was this was the first Olympics to where, well, the first Olympics I've been a part of to where we were still together when we found out. So we got the email that named you and then you got an email like 20 minutes later that's like, hey, as soon as you're done calling people, whatever, please proceed down to whatever conference room. And Delaney Spaulding was, I think, the first one down there. And I was like the second or third. But just getting to watch these, this, this younger generation of players come down and get to celebrate a dream that at some point they weren't sure they were going to have come true and like watching them hug each other cry like just the emo all the emotions um it was cool to be part of that like don't get me wrong I was excited and hugging them too but just watching the younger ones who had you know you have Val and Michelle Val Ariotto and Michelle Moultrie who've been on the team since since we walked away in 2010 um who didn't know back in 2011 if they were ever going to have a shot at the Olympics. Yeah. Um, you have some that joined in 14 and 15 again before it was in that you didn't know if there was going to be a shot. And to watch them see this unfold um, was really a really cool moment. That was one of those that I wish like we had had a documentary going because that would have been a really cool video shot to see everybody getting so excited. That's true. Wow. See, you got a, you got a good mind for the media. We'll get into that because you, you got to – that somebody should have come up with that idea. Hey, let's shoot the video here of people that make it and then edit it later. You know, that, that's pretty good. Uh, now, you mentioned this was the first time you're all together, so that was different than 04 and 08. Take me to the 04 because that was the first time. You were at college. You were at Texas at the time. Describe that experience, making it for the first time, and take me through that. Where, was that something – that you were expecting to make it? Was it a surprise? Like, how did that all come about? Because you were still in college and you're kind of, you know, you can probably relate to what Rachel and even Bubba and Deja are going to be going through. Uh, they were the college players on part of the team. Yeah, so um, prior to the 04, we have tryouts in September of 04. Why I remember the exact month, I have no clue, but September. And so when the school year ended in May of 04, um, Coach Clark had had a meeting with my parents and I, our compliance director, our academic people, um, because Coach Kendrea had said that when you try out for the 04 team, if you make it, you're going to be asked to redshirt. If you're an alternate, you get the choice. And so here I'm thinking, like, I'm going to enroll in the fall. Worst case, we withdraw. Best case, I get to, you know, go to school in the fall, but I just won't go in the spring. We'll figure it out. And we sit down and have this meeting and coach Clark was like, no, you're just not going to go to school. And I'm like, but I get the choice. Oh, this was, yeah, this was before I think. Um, because yeah, I, I didn't register. She's like, so we're just not going to register you. And then if you may, if you don't make it for some reason, when you get back, we'll figure out how to register you and get you caught up. And I'm like, okay, but, but why would we do it that? Like I was confused, but I was like, okay, that's fine. So I go to tryouts in September. And now, like, being a coach and in hindsight, I feel like her and Coach Kendrea probably had a conversation of, like, what the likelihood is. Yeah, they must. she must have had known. She must have known. That's why she didn't want you to register. Did, and I don't know. Confident. Never, neither one has ever told me they had a conversation. I'm just thinking of it. Sure. Like, but still, to me, I was like, I'm the youngest person trying out. This is insane. Like, so I go to tryouts. And, again, from 01 to 04, I – I knew the process I'd been through, you know, for this was going to be my fourth tryout now. Um, and again, I knew what kind of performance was needed. Um, and I, th and I threw well, and I, my dad didn't go to the 04 tryout. He was at my very first one, but I was reporting to him every day, like what was going on. He sounds, sound, sounds like you're throwing well from everything I hear. And there were message boards were booming at the time. And I think there were some dads that were or softball people that were, you know, posting what they saw. And he's like, from what I hear, you're throwing well. And, I left there and I was like, if I don't make it, it's because I'm young. Like, and I was okay with that. And then, yeah, that one, um, seeing my name on that list. So yeah, 04 and 08, you know, we tried out Chula Vista and then we threw, we flew home and then they sent an email, um, either while we were flying or as soon as we got home. And, um, yeah, I landed and I saw my name and I, I lost it. Um, I called my parents and I was like, I can't believe it. 
um, you know, and my dad's very realistic. He's like, you've been throwing well, like I knew you had a shot. And, um, I just was blown away because I really thought my age was going to be the biggest factor. Um, and the fact that I was still in school, um, I had only been in two years of school. I wasn't even like it was my senior year. We're going into my junior year. Um, but then, yeah, I redshirted and, you know, that experience is something that coach Erickson tapped into. So after the team was named and we had that initial first team meeting, um, he asked me to stay and he, well, he was like, I need all the college kids. And I, of course, started kind of being like, ha ha, I've been there. And he goes, oh no, sit down. You've been through this. So you're going to stay too. And I was like, oh man. Um, but it was, it was kind of talking to them to how to navigate it because, um, you know, It'll be different this year, as you mentioned, they'll get to stay in school. But, you know, when they were with us in January, February, March, I'm like, you can't, you can't play the, oh, I wish I were in school or I'm missing out on this because you're doing an experience that any one of them would give their right arm for. And so we had a conversation, but um, yeah, the 04 team, it was a dream, but it was something I didn't honestly think was very gonna, gonna happen. And then, um, you know, thankfully, uh, 2003 at the Pan Am Games, Coach Candrea had given me the ball in the championship game. And uh, I think that was, without knowing it, that was my kind of test. And thankfully, I think my naivety allowed me to pass. <laughs> I mean, that was a historic team. We've had many members on. Coach Erickson's talked about it. I mean, that was a historic team. You made, really, softball exploded in the United States. I mean, you're on the cover of Sports Illustrated. I'm seeing the title now, the real dream team you know, comparing it to the 92 men's basketball team. You got to be a part of that team. What was that like? Were you aware of the hoopla? Because people were watching in big numbers in droves. I've even mentioned it. That was when I really started locking in on softball. Like, I've joked with you, like, I've seen – I knew you more from USA softball than I did from Texas. Uh, and that was a who's who roster there with Mendoza and, you know, and then Lisa Fernandez and Laura Berg and, and Watley and, and Finch. And I mean, it was a, it's a, it's a, a team that really broke a lot of barriers. What being around that as the youngster, what was that like? Um, you know, it was an incredible experience. I think some of the names you mentioned though, it was, it was fun because we all broke in together. So you have the core group of Lisa, Leah, Laura, um, Stacy Freed, Lori, who had all already been at the Olympics. And then you had the court, then you had the group of me, Mendoza, um, Finch, Watley, Lovey, J who all broke in in 2001 and were in that first 2001 group. We split into two teams, but we were all part of that. And in fact, most of us, I think, I think we've gone back and like most of us were on the same team that 2001 summer. So, um, but you had the, the core group of the experience, but then you had like the new youngsters coming in. And um, it was just such a great blend of people and athletes. Um, I tried as much as possible to soak everything in and kind of follow, it was more obviously a follower being the youngest. Um, fortunate Lori Harrigan took me under her wing. We've talked about that before, but um, to this day, still someone I'm forever grateful for, for helping me figure out at a young age how to how to be in the program, how to grow in the program, how to work in the program. Um, but, you know, that was just an incredible year with those girls um, or those women to, to see everyone, you know, when they said, hey, get off the bus and go run, we did. And when they said, hey, we're going to go lift, we did. And, you know, practice, the goal of practice was to have a perfect practice. And I don't know if we ever actually hit a perfect practice for Coach Candrea, but when that's your goal in practice, it makes the games easier. Um, so, it was a fun time and it was probably for me one of the first experiences of like seeing all the hard work we do actually pay off in a lot like you got to see the whole process when you looked back how have you changed from that youngster there as a college to now as the veteran on the olympic team because i'm sure there's things you learned from that experience now that you're on the other side you're the veteran you're the, the you know you're the lisa fernandez you're the one now that's getting a lot of the media uh, request, if you will, uh, whereas Jenny and Lisa took a lot of those back then. What did you learn from that experience that you will apply to this ver this Olympic team now as the veteran and and looked at as one of the leaders? Yeah, I think, well, I think the first thing, I mean, I'm different as far as, you know, obviously 21 to 37. Um, there's 20 or 16 years in there of, of learning how to be a better teammate, learning how to be a leader, obviously having been a coach, um, having the mind of, 
of knowing kind of what coaches do and why sometimes. And the other experience that I have is there were times that there were times that we did things that we looked at them and kind of questioned why we were like, we questioned it, but didn't like, we didn't actually verbally questioned it, but we were kind of like, what's going on right now. And then you realize like two weeks later, like that was a test. Like they literally just tested us somehow um, without realizing it. And I remember in 04, it was, um, we were in Italy and it, the bus got lost on the way to a game. And we had no idea when they were testing us. We really were just like, oh shoot. Like, and we showed up 20, 30 minutes before the game was supposed to start. And I was pitching. And so Erickson's like, what are you gonna do? I'm like, oh, go warm up, we're fine. He's like, you only got 30 minutes. I'm like, all right, I'll be ready. But at the same time, he's like, you know what? The game can't start without you. So take your time, do what you need to do. I'm like, you know, I'll be good, whatever. And, and we went and, you know, but in, in the moment you really think the bus gets lost. You don't think, oh, they're like staging this whole thing. But it, the whole thing had, I guarantee the whole thing was staged. Staged, trying to test you. Yeah. And, and so it's funny because there's times now that I'm like, I think this might be a test. So we might want to think about how we answer this. Um, but then the other part I know is that, you know, there's times where you're wondering why, why our conditioning is what it is or why we're going hard for so many days in a row. And some of it is just to mentally hit the wall and know that we can still go after you hit the wall. Um, and so I, I try to bring that and, and those experiences and, and that knowledge of, of how the program's always worked. And then obviously I think once we get right closer to starting to get over there, I can, I can talk a little bit about, you know, the nerves you feel the first time you step, it can be the same field you've played on before, but when you see the Olympic, uh, I almost said propaganda, but that's not the right word, but all the banners and everything with the rings and you right. realize like, at these, it's, it, it's different. It's just like in college, you can play a hundred college games, but the second you get to the world series, it's different. Um, so I can talk about that a little bit and you know, how as a 21 year old, I dealt with it. How as a 25 year old, I dealt with it and how, you know, we're going to have to prepare and be when we're over there. So, um, I think I'm, I'm kind of like the wise, I want to say a wise owl or mama bear. I try not to say a whole lot, but I try to throw in when I can, um, you know, things I know from the past experiences in the quad and just give them a, a different perspective to think about. Well, and that's the thing. And you mentioned this, you've mentioned in past interviews, it's unfinished business. You were there with the silver. You've gone through both feelings, winning that gold medal, being winning that medal in 04, not winning the gold in 08, losing to Japan in 08. You've gone through that, those two experiences. Uh, Laura Berg's the only other one that could say that that's on, you know, she's on the coaching staff. That, I'm sure that's something that you'll remind these players. You've been the highs and the lows of the Olympics, and, and you're going to probably re re relay that to these players that haven't gone through that. Yeah, well, I think there's times that Coach Erickson says, you know, you can, you can win or lose by a fingernail. You can win or lose by a split second. And, and the game can turn based on a fingernail or a split second and things like that. And I think as you work, the biggest thing is you don't want to work you don't ever want to take it. I don't want to say not take a day off, but you don't ever want to take a rep off or something and then think, Oh man, if I would have worked just a little bit harder, if I would have worked on that just a little bit different, like would the outcome of the game, like you don't want to have any regrets. And so, um, that, but then at the same time, you know, talking about the 08 game, the first, the first run was a bang, you know, it was a play that we ended up making a fielder's choice to get the out at first, but we had a runner at third and they just happened to hit a ground ball slow enough that we had to get the out instead of trying to make the play at home. And, and that was hard. Um, that was really hard to think about because, you know, how many times did we practice that? And like, could we have done something different? Um, and not that we didn't work hard prior to that quad, you know, I'll still say till the day I die that oh, that game was just a nightmare of a game for us. I mean, anything that could go wrong did go wrong. Um, it just was not our day. It's not that we weren't playing well. I mean, we played well the whole tournament. Um, it just was not our day that day. Um, and a lot of people were in point and be like, oh, it was so different. And there were some things different from the 04 team to the 08 team, but, but not enough that, you know, one game hinges on that. So, um, but, you know, I've been through both and I know what it, they feel like and I would prefer not to feel um, the feelings of 08 again. And so I just kind of try to occasionally remind them that, there is something that is ours that has been out of our possession for 12 years. And um, it would be nice to get it back and not the sole reason I unretired, but um, obviously that's, you know, your eyes on the prize anytime you're going to go into an event like this. 
Yeah, and the format's tough because you can run rough shot. You could be playing at a high level, get to the gold medal game, but only lose once, lose to a team that maybe lost once or twice, but that doesn't matter. It's the gold medal game, so you lost. I mean, and, I, you know, Laura Berg, to her credit, she mentioned that U.S. benefited from that in, the, you know, in, I think in 2000 they came from the different side of the bracket. But I wish it was double elimination because softball's always been double elimination. Uh, and it is in other world uh, international events. I think the Pan American games are, are double elimination as well, right? Because you had to – you dropped the game and had to beat Canada twice in that 2019 Pan American games. And the sport has grown, and I'm sure that's the one of the things you've noticed being back, how the, the world is so much better. Canada is loaded. Japan is still strong, loaded. Like all six teams that are going to be there in the Olympics – have tremendous talent and can win games and can medal and can compete for the goal. It's not like it was say in 04, whereas maybe you and Australia and Japan and everybody else basically. Yeah, no, the game's grown. Um, I think the, the, um, I mean, it had to give everybody time to adjust to. So when I started playing in 01, that was the first year. No, 01, we were still at 40. So 02, I think is when they moved back to 43, the fences moved back, like everything adjusted. And so, you had to give country, I mean, playing at 43 feet here wasn't an anomaly because you were doing it in college. Everybody else wasn't doing it anywhere else. So you have to give everybody time to adjust, not just the pitchers that are on the team that year, but the ones that are developing now. And so um, I think that was a big thing of, of just allowing all the countries to adjust um, and adjust their game and the way you can play the game. I mean, obviously with shorter fences and stuff, it, you could play more small ball. Now you can hit a gap and get a triple, which was non-existent before the fence has changed. Um, so it allows the game to be a little different. And then, yeah, I mean, everyone's growing. Um, I think you mentioned, you know, the 04 team, the 04 Olympics kind of heightened softball here in the U.S., but I think it heightened softball in a lot of places. You know, Australia was in a gold medal game against us. Um, Japan made, made a run, obviously lost to, to Australia in the semifinal, um, but they were up there. And then, you know, just from years after that, you know, Kiko Ueno got in Japan's program about the same time I got in USA's program. And so to see her just continue to establish herself and then emerge as, as their person, like their face of the game over there, and they continue to work around her. And, um, you know, it's, it's cool to see because for a long time they tried to piece things together. And now you see these countries have, you know, elite pitchers and, you know, Canada's always been strong and um, have just gotten stronger with the fact that a lot of their athletes get looks to come play softball in the U.S. Um, and they take advantage of it, which is really awesome to see. And um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what their final roster looks like. You make a great point about the 04 team and the influence it's had on the world game. It's kind of like the 92 basketball dream team. That team has gotten credit because the basketball has exploded globally. You got superstars now in the NBA that are international to the point where the U.S. have been caught up in these events. Uh, Luka Doncic is one of the top players in the NBA. The Dirk Nowitzkis of the world. They've all, they all said the 92 team influenced them. And your 04 team was kind of the same way, wasn't it, for softball? Because everybody – there was – people looked up to you. People looked up to Jenny Finch, Jessica Mendoza. I mean, look at the names on that roster you all have. You've gone on to do big things, in the, not only in the sport of softball, but even outside of softball. Uh, so that's kind of a legacy there of that 04 team that, you know, you mentioned earlier about, you know, documentaries. I'd like to see a documentary on that 04 team, kind of like they did with the 92 basketball team, because your team really transcended softball and maybe to now the detriment to some extent of USA softball because of the competition's gotten tougher and better. Yeah, competition's got tougher and better, but man, that team, and I'm, our competition was tough even then, but we were just so trained. So we were a well-oiled machine by the time we got over there um, that it, you know, we were able to be in the zone almost for a whole tournament because we had trained so hard. We had gone through the tour. We had, um, you know, everything was strategically laid out and yeah, we got over there and, after the first game, everyone settled in and, and we rolled with it. Um, it'd be fun to do a doc. I would be interested to hear what everyone remembers about tour and obviously being over there and about each other. I know occasionally um, if someone moves or we clean out things, like you'll get, we'll have group texts where it's like, hey, anyone remember this? And it's a picture um, because obviously they're like the actual printed out pictures from way back then. Um, and it's just fun. It's, it's fun to reminisce about um, on occasion, but uh, it would be interesting to see what everybody remembers. About well, that. 
20 year anniversary will be in 2024. Be, you know, it could be a good time to do it. They've done it with the 99 U S world women's soccer world cup team. They've done documentaries. I've spoken to Michelle Akers about that. I think you, t- you all, heck you were on the SI cover. As I mentioned earlier, I think you've earned that, right? I think that team uh, in particular, that'd be kind of cool. So you've got more, you got more influence than I do. So you could probably make it happen more than I can, but let's throw it out there for everybody. Yeah, we can see. <laughs> we're speaking with Kat Osterman here on in the circle. Uh, 2020 was kind of interesting for you because one of the dis- tough decisions you had to make was stepping down as assistant at Texas State, which made the sports center bottom line, you know, which is a big deal. They're not often a softball assistant makes headlines on the, uh, on the sports center ticker. So it's, it's a uh, sports day. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, you could say that, but what was it like for you this fall? not being a part of a college, you know, Texas state for the first time, as far as being around a team there for a while, was that unique? Was it weird for you? Uh, and just take us through that process, deciding to kind of step away from that and not being around the college team here for the first time in years. Yeah. Um, it was a little different. I mean, yeah, I've been a college coach for 12 years. So there's like one year in the middle where I went and played in Japan, but other than that, you know, college softball has been what I do year round. And so, um, Thankfully, Athletes Unlimited was at the beginning of the school year, so um, that entertained me. But um, the joke, the running joke was, you know, I got home on a Sunday, I think, and Monday I went up to Texas State and visited. <laughs> so obviously I was having some withdrawals. Um, but I enjoy being around Coach Woodard and Coach Long and Coach McDuffie, and um, I think that's been the hardest part for me. I love the girls too, and I miss them, but um, having coached with Coach Woodard for six years, uh, we're, we're family. Um, I know, you know, I've watched her boys grow up. Um, obviously when we went out to, um, Auburn, when her brother worked there, I have gotten to know her family and, um, you know, she's someone who's very important to me. And so was coach Long and coach McDuffie. And so for me, it's, it's, it's like missing a piece of me that I was with every day for so many years. Um, but, uh, it was different. Um, my husband laughed at me cause I woke up and was like, so what do I do? <laughs> He's like, whatever you want to do, I guess you're probably going to work out and do yoga and do that. And I was like, okay, I can only work out so many hours. Then what do I do? And, but um, I've been able to, uh, to keep myself busy, but it was different. Um, I think the other piece is just seeing the girls post pictures or talking about, you know, if it was, if they were going to have a scrimmage or whatever, and just not being part of that development when I, got, I, I recruited all and most of those girls and I've been part of their process and knowing now that I'm not. Um, and just, you know, that piece is hard, but at the same time, I've enjoyed having time. I've enjoyed being able to slow down just a little bit, um, only a little bit, but then at the same time, be able to go up there when I can and, and see them and be a little bit more relaxing mode instead of coaching. Um, although it's hard because I watch them sometimes and I want to say something and I'm like, not your coach anymore. So I'm going to defer, but, um, I'll still, I'll be their biggest fan. And whenever I'm home in the spring, if they have games and I can go, um, I'll be there with my bells and whistles on. I don't know what happened. I can't hear you. Well, that's good. Uh, what do you uh, take me through? You know, the decision obviously was tough. You had a lot of things going on, you know, that you just felt you couldn't lock into coaching right now. You got, you know, with the Olympics and everything going on, did it make you feel better that Coach McDuffie, for example, took over and it's people that you're familiar with that you trust that'll take care of the players that made it a little easier for you in the transition? Yeah. So um, when I started playing again, um, there was something in my heart that just wanted to have more opportunities to give back and do other things. Um, there's an organization in Austin, RBI Austin, I've been part of for six years now. And um, I've been a very small part because with NCAA rules, I can't do as much as I want to with them. And so um, that plus clinics that I get asked to do and just interacting online, all those things. Um, so I wanted to be able to have a little bit more freedom and then um, obviously we've talked about 2020 turning plans upside down, but my husband and I had talked about possibly, um, trying to have a kid after the Olympics. And so the more we talked, um, I ended up having a conversation with coach Woodard about just the fact that I didn't want to come back from the Olympics and then be like, Hey, surprise, if it works out, I'm pregnant and I have to take off time again. Um, and just personally, I was at a point that I needed, I needed more time for me and, um, me knowing my personality, um, I can 
I'm sure there are weekends where she wants me to go recruit. And if I needed to be like, Hey, no, I want to go see my nephew or no, I'm, you know, my brother's coming into, I can tell her that, but me as a person, I won't, I'll do my job because that's what I'm supposed to do. And so me knowing that I was like, I need to step away. And, and I said, I go, I think it's a perfect time though. Cause coach McDuffie's already taking over me for pitching for me right now. And, um, she's doing a great job and she works well with all of us. So I think, you know, for me, I knew I wasn't leaving her high and dry. I wasn't going to leave her searching for somebody else. Um, it, there was going to be an easy kind of an easy transition. Um, and one that the pitchers already were going to be comfortable with too. So it all played in and, um, coach McDuffie is amazing. We did, you know, we worked together my last, my last year there and, um, she brought some new good perspectives and she still occasionally will text and, She'll be like, all right, has this happened before? And we'll talk through things um, and it's fun. And um, I'll still be, you know, go up there and, and chat with them and be involved. But yeah, it was an easier decision knowing um, that there was somebody there that could, could take the job. And like, not that I needed to trust them, but just in my heart, I knew I could leave them in their hands and it, it would be a good transition. Um, but it didn't necessarily make it any easier 100% on me or Coach Woodard. Um, but, uh, you know. We still text quite often, holidays, ranch. She checks in randomly about how life is. I check in as much as possible and feel like I'm trying to feel like I'm not bothering them because I know that there's work to be done. Um, but yeah, so uh, it was hard, but um, at the same time, it's it's been really good for me. And I think I don't really make a lot of decisions for myself very often. And so this was one that, that needed to be done. And um, yeah, I'm in a good place with it. And as I said, I'm still going to be those their biggest fan, and um, it'll be fun. To be well, and you made a, instead of the stress of calling pitches. Just calling pitches, yeah. I mean, that's a lot of deal. But you left a lasting impact there on the program. Very pot, you know, you helped develop someone like Randy Rupp, who's had a great career as pitching athletes to limit it. Uh, made the NCAA tournament. I remember they even this off seat when there was the, the NCAA was airing a lot of softball games. One of the games they aired was, of course, Texas State against Texas. Uh, with the, the, the obvious story lines there, but you got, I mean, Texas State got a lot of attention and, and you had a lot of success. What's the legacy you want that people remember you as the coach at Texas State and the impact you made on that program? Because you made a big impact. I mean, I really hope I, I left it better than I found it. Um, you know, obviously it was a strong program to begin with, but um, I hope the players there really um, could sense that like I was invested in them as people uh, more so than just athletes and, um, you know, I feel like, I feel like they know that I've gotten, you know, obviously invites to weddings, baby, baby announcements, all of that. Um, and I, I do my best to, if I can't get there, at least get a wedding gift or a baby gift sent. If I can get there, um, I get there and, um, just, you know, able to celebrate them because they are, I mean, they're some incredible young women that I was able to hopefully help, um, transition into life. And, you know, for me, my coaches, my parents have always been playing an important part of my life, but my coaches were also people that I, I looked to for guidance. And so I wanted to be that um, for athletes and from a, a young age, that's what I wanted to do. And so I just hope that um, they, they knew that I was invested and I wanted to see the best for them. And um, hopefully uh, with the program, you know, I left, I left my competitiveness and my loyalty and uh, you know, my love there in San Marcos. So you've stepped away from coaching, but a lot of your uh, former teammates are still coaching in the college game and in some cases getting promoted to head coaching jobs. I want to ask you about a few of your teammates. So you're going to put your analyst chair because you're going to ask, you're going to answer like, what is each, each person going to bring to the table? For example, Chelsea Spencer, you know very well, you played with part of the 09 Rockford championship team, has been an assistant on Texas under Mike White at Oregon prior to that. She's now back at her alma mater. She's the new head coach at Cal. Your reaction to her getting that opportunity and what will she bring to Cal? Uh, I was so excited to hear her name when they said she was going to be the head coach. I, since 09, um, she's been, never made it a secret that that was her dream job was to be able to go back to Cal. And so um, watching her put those pieces in place from being at Michigan State to Oregon to Texas, um, putting herself in a place to where she can learn everything she needs to learn. Um, I was super excited to see when they announced her because I know that's her lifelong dream. And um, you always just want to see your friends be able to, to make it work. Um, and, you know, Chelsea has passion unlike anyone else. Um, and she's very, she shows it and she lets it, it's something that's contagious almost. You like want to feed off of it. 
And um, I tell people all the time, we played in Rockford and there were moments that, you know, I get super serious and not down, but I just get serious to where I almost don't let the adrenaline come. And, and she would just walk up and be like, hey, hey, I need more from you. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. And there'd be other times, you know, there's just strategic of defense is something that she's such, she's such a genius at, to be honest. Um, I remember one situation we had bases loaded and one out and um, I don't remember who was at bat and who was hitting, but she looked at me and said, Hey, if it's hit at you, let's turn two. And I looked, I'm like, why the heck wouldn't we go home? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and she's like, look, look who's running. And I looked and I'm like, Oh, sure enough. Next pitch it's hit to me. We turn two, we're out of the, we're out of the inning. And I'm just like, Holy cow. Like, you manifested that. Um, but she's just a genius in thinking about things that way and then being able to teach it. Um, watching her teach is incredible because she's able to demonstrate and verbalize and recreate things um, for athletes. So I think she's going to do a good job there. She has the passion for cow softball. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's something to be said for somebody that wants a job and wants to be there. Um, even if maybe on paper, they weren't not saying she's not what they wanted, but just even on paper, you don't necessarily see it when they have a passion for that job that you're going to get more out of them. And so i um, super excited to see what she does there. And hopefully she can take them back to the world series as a, as a coach. Cause you know, we got to see her there as a player when we were both well in Oh three. I don't remember. Oh, that's right. Yeah, a little while there. Yeah, that's right. And she's off to a good start. She had Ron Rivera and, her, and his wife donated to the program for the stadium, uh, the stadium, the new stadium they're building over their renovation. There was a story about that because you, you're friends with Coach Rivera and the family there. That, and you and Chelsea and, and the Rivera family go way back, right? Yeah, so Chelsea obviously met them when she was at Cal because um, Steph and Ron went there. And then um, I met them in Chicago when I worked there when he was with the Bears. Um, because their younger daughter, Courtney, was, uh, is, was a softball player and a pitcher. And so um, she came to a clinic. I worked out. We got to know them. Incredible people. I mean, anything you read is the truth, to be honest. They are so incredible. Um, he's an amazing coach, husband, and father. And I, how he juggles it all is still beyond me. Um, and then at the same time, answers, I think, every text he ever gets, um, post-game, pre-game, you name it. So um, they're incredible people. And then, yeah, so when we were in Rockford, um, Chelsea was like, oh, wait, you know them? And I was like, yeah. And then um, a couple times we, when he was in San Diego, we went to a game together. So it was fun for the, all three of us to be there. But um, yeah, it, uh, no surprise that they're going to help out because they, they love Cal. They love softball because their daughter played it. She played at UCLA, but um, it was not a shock to me to see them, them help out, especially when they have a relationship with Chelsea. Such an inspirational guy too. Everybody that he, everything he's gone through with his health there, beating cancer there, finally cancer uh, free recently. Coach still coaching in the NFL with the, in his first year with Washington, trying to turn that franchise around. What's that like for you as a friend to see him go through those battles and battle it, and and still doing what he loves to do? If you know him, the second you heard that you know he was battling, you just knew he was going to come out on the other side, like. There's just never a question. I mean, he does, he, he does things the right way. Um, he handles people the right way. He just, it's one of the, he's, he's an all genuine all around great man. And, um, you know, uh, I knew he was going to battle it and it's no surprise that he stayed coaching because that's his job and he has responsibility to people. And that's kind of how I feel like he felt was like, no, this is what I'm going to do. And I, if I can do both, I'm going to do both. And if it gets to the point I can't, then I'll admit it. But, um, you know, he's inspiring and he always has been even prior to being diagnosed with cancer. Um, just hearing him talk, if, if you don't get inspired, I, you're missing something inside you. Yeah. Good question. Uh, a couple other coaches that got head coaching jobs, Elisa Goler now at Western Illinois, Charlotte Morgan, at CISO was part of the 2010 UAAA Pride Championship team. There was your second MPF championship team. Your thoughts on those two now being head coaches as two of them you, you know very well. Yeah, I think the, the key for both of them is they're both kind of near, near their home. Um, so they're both familiar with the area that they're coaching in, obviously. Goler being in Illinois and then um, Charlotte being there in, in California. But, um, you know, Goler has been – She's been doing this for a while, obviously assistant uh, at Syracuse and then um, Penn State. Penn State yep. and so um, to see her get that job, when she, she told me that she put in an application, she was like, I figured, I mean, I might as well just go through the process. And then 
we we're talking about it. I'm like, why do you think you wouldn't be a good fit? And she's like, well, I just haven't been a head coach before. And I'm like, so like it's a mid major, it's close to where you're from, you know, Illinois, you know, your stuff, you've played at a high level. Like you have a lot of things to add. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, when she said she was actually doing like the final interviews, I was like, Oh, you got this, like, you're good. And so I was really excited to see that because I do think she's in a place where she can offer a lot to those athletes because she's been there, done that um, at so many levels. And, and the same with Charlotte. I mean, Charlotte played at Alabama. She's a pitcher, hitter, first base. She covers all, you know, all facets of the game, but at the same time played at a high level, has enough connections in the game that she knows, you know, she's used them to, to keep herself in the game and to be around the game. And, um, you know, I think they're both really good softball minds. And I think hopefully athletes understand what they're getting in their head coaches because yeah, they both can, can think the game, talk the game. And, um, if their athletes, you know, listen, absorb, follow, um, I think they're both going to do really good things with, with the programs that they're inheriting. What's it like for you when, cause you follow the new, you follow it, all the coaching transactions, when you have friends of yours, play, people you've played with that are getting into coaching or getting the head coaching jobs. I know there's others we won't even have time to get into that got into it, but what is that like for you? Cause I'm sure they reach out to you. I mean, even when we had coach go, we had a goaler on, she joked about, she was going to text you and try to convince you to join her staff when, when she got the job. But what, what does that mean when you have people and they reach out to you for their input and advice and they're, you know, they're moving on to the coaching industry where you did it for so long. I mean, it's fun. I mean, it's fun to be able to have um, friends that trust you, that people in the game trust you and, and call you for advice or for opinions or to talk through things. Um, because you've been in it for so long, but you've also been on all sides of it. Um, so I enjoy getting to watch my friends, um, you know, climb the ladder, so to speak, and see what, where their career takes them. And um, I think there were times that, you know, some of my friends and I thought that maybe we would be on a staff together, but obviously um, I'm making some other decisions these days, but um, it's fun to see. And then for me, it's fun to follow because now I get to follow friends um, and see what they're doing and, and how they are impacting their kids. And um, I actually stopped at Western on my way home from uh, Athletes Unlimited and visited with Bowler and, you know, met some of her athletes, got to go watch a couple practices that they had the day I got there. Um, and just see how she's already um, kind of changing the program and, and putting her mark on it. So it was fun to see because, you know, being a head coach is completely different than being an assistant. So being able to mold a program to be the culture you want is, is really cool. And um, I know both of them are gonna do incredible things. Now, you mentioned some of the decisions you're making. One of them that you're making that you've been uh, talking about on social media a little bit, you have your own podcast. You're starting up your own podcast soon. Tell us a little about what led to that decision and what's your podcast going to be about. Yeah, so um, part of my decision post-Olympics, if it had gone off in 2020, um, I was going to start to kind of work into um, a job being, I guess, kind of a motivational speaker, um, so to speak. Um, with a uh, young man named Stephen Mackey, who is here in Texas, and I've developed a relationship with. And so he challenged me to do um, what he calls speaker burpees, where you basically just record yourself talking about something for seven to 10 minutes a day. Um, and so at Athletes Unlimited, I did that not, not every day, like he had asked, but every couple of days, sometimes once a week. Um, yeah. But I always tried to wait till I had a topic that I was really passionate about. And so I would send them to him. And actually, I sent him one right when we got home from Athletes Unlimited. And he said, all right, cool. When are we going public with this? And I was like, I thought the whole point of this was just me getting comfortable, like, <laughs> without stopping and saying, right. um, and whatever. And he's like, no, this is good stuff. When are we going public with it? I was like, what do you mean? It's like a podcast. And I was like, okay, I can do that. I mean, I don't have to look at anybody. I can just speak into my phone or a microphone and talk. Um, so we're in the process. Um, it could already be done if I would just do the things I need to do. Um, but I'm going to aim for February. Okay. Who wants to launch things? Everyone launches everything in January. So we'll just wait till February. Um, I think it, I'm like 99% sure it's going to be called Cat Chats. Um, Cat's Corner is my blog, always has been. So um, it's a podcast that it's going to be short and sweet, 15, 20 minutes, maybe. Occasionally, there might be a longer one because I'll have a guest on to talk about something. Um, but really, I'm trying to take things I learned in sport and um, talk about it outside of sport. So um, 
I've done a few on confidence, self-love, motivation. Um, I don't remember what my last one was, but I, I have about eight or 10 recorded that I've, I've done over the last couple months. Um, rough drafts of them. I'll go back and, and re-record them and polish them up a little bit. But um, just topics that, you know, sport has taught me, but how now am I, you know, pertaining that to real life or how am I helping raise my stepdaughter with those thought processes and things like that. Um, so it's not going to be 100% softball related. doesn't mean there's not going to be some softball sometimes. Um, but trying to just more give people in general, if athletes listen to it, great. If, you know, people my age listen to it and you get motivated or you get a nugget out of it, great. Um, but just 15, 20 minutes of like, hey, remember this in life and here's a challenge. Let's go with it. Um, if you're anything like me, attention spans bounce off the walls after about 20 minutes of a podcast. So I usually have to pause them, listen to a song and then come back to it. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm excited about it. It's just something different. Um, I like to talk and yeah, I think I've been around sport long enough and it's molded me into who I am and given me the life I have that I um, want to share with people like the takeaways and where you can find those, you know, where other people can find those in their life and you don't necessarily have to be in sport to find it. How much of it too is giving back? Cause you have so many fans and you've seen it on social media or a young lady girl will buy your Jersey and post it on Twitter. Like, or they get a, they take, they post a photo they took with you and like, I got to see your pitch or I got to like, you have a lot of, you've, a, you've touched a lot of people. Uh, and I, and I think this sounds like this is a way for you to kind of give back and, and maybe give advice to people. Then it's the beauty of technology today is that you can reach out to people without directly talking to them by doing a podcast and kind of sharing what's helped you be successful at where you're at, but that you, you can, other people can apply this to what they want to do. Right. Yeah. I mean, it is giving back. And I think, um, you touched on it. Social media now, technology now is so different than when I started playing. I mean, you talk about that. Oh, four team. We didn't have Twitter, Instagram. I mean, we, a couple of us had Facebook, but you had to have a college email address to have Facebook at the time. I mean, it wasn't even public to everyone. So social media has blown up so much that, and technology has that, um, you know, it gives us different avenues now. So yeah, this is a, a way for me to give advice without having to be one-on-one -on -one with somebody or necessarily answering a direct message that somebody sends. Um, I can go ahead and, you know, put this out and people can learn and apply and feel like maybe they learn a little bit of my journey that they didn't know already. Um, but I, I think too, for me, I look at it as, and I said this early on, um, when I first unretired, I feel like I kind of transcend generations because there are women who are my age or a little bit older than me even that are like, oh, I watched you when you were at Texas and now my daughter is watching you. Um, so it's like, I got, the mom watched me 04 and 08 and now the daughter gets to watch me in 28 and 21 or whatever. And, and that's pretty cool. Um, how many people, you know, get to transcend and see multiple generations um, you know, be fans or just continue or to learn from you or whatever. And so this is a way to kind of, I feel like I could connect with all sorts of generations this way and, and yeah, give back a little bit. Yeah. I would say that's pretty big. And I mean, a lot of people got to see you over the summer that Longhorn network did a whole day dedicated to you eight. What is it? Eight out. Was it eight games the whole day? Like eight of your games at Texas. Yeah. What was that like? What's it like watching yourself play? Cause I'm sure you watch some of that coverage and even showed other games of yours the NCAA did throughout the summer when there was nothing going on. You got to watch yourself play. What goes through your mind when you're watching yourself? Um, there's sometimes I, I don't remember certain part. Like I remembered a part of a game differently than really how it played out, which is weird because my friends in college would have told you, like, I remembered everything. <laughs> um, like senior, I could have told you what somebody did freshman year off of us. Um, and then there are other parts where I'm like, that happened? I don't remember that. Um, or that the announcer will tell a story that like Coach Clark or somebody shared and I'm like, huh? <laughs> so it's kind of like a time capsule. You get to go back in, in time yeah. and, and hear about things. Um, and then there's other times where I see myself throw like back-to-back change-ups and I'm like, when did you ever, when did, was this the only time in your life you did that? Because I don't remember throwing a change-up that much. Um, I do remember a brief stint where we tried to add a screwball to the mix. So you see it occasionally in a game and I'm like, Oh, why did we do that? And I'm like, that was a terrible idea. Um, it was never a strike. It was always a ball. Um, but so it was a fun trip down memory lane. Um, my husband was like, can you just watch the game and quit commentating about all of it? And I was like, 
just how I, I mean, I don't know how to watch a game. And not well, the NCAA on had you commentate um, on one of the games, right? Didn't they bring you in for an interview to commentate during one of the games you did in the World Series? Uh, yeah, they did. We did a brief interview um, on the one, uh, the Arizona game in the World Series, which was a really cool, still one of my favorite games um, I've ever pitched. But, um, but that game even, I didn't know that the, their bases were loaded <laughs> in the last out. I literally <laughs> thought there was like maybe one person on. And then we watched the game. I'm like, oh. Their face was loaded. Got it. That's um, funny. And That's I walked them. Like I walked, I walked two of the people. So I was like, uh oh. But it was like the 14th inning, so I'm pretty sure at two o'clock and the midday of Oklahoma, I was also dying. But yeah, um, the weather was a little hot. Yeah, it was a little different time there. You know, yeah. I but, made- yeah, it was fun to watch and just kind of go down. I recorded all of them so I can go back and watch whenever I Smart. want. Smart. Um, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the Longhorn Network because a lot of those games, I never, like I've, I've told you, I never saw you pitch live at Texas because the coverage wasn't as big as it is now. So that, like, for example, I remember a lot of those games was the first time I saw you at Texas, like the no hitter you threw against Oklahoma in Norman uh, yeah. with Vesley and company. I never seen that game before. Even your last home game, which was a regional against Lori and Washington. And they kept showing your mom who was in attendance uh that had to be a special game for you but I never remembered those games because I didn't the only times I saw you pitch was either with live was with USA softball or in the NPF yeah well and I think that was the fun part because um like nowadays (laughs) I laugh when people like hey show a clip of your first game at Texas I'm like um first of all it's probably on VHS somewhere in Texas's office secondly it wasn't on TV and I have never seen it (laughs) so I don't know um, but it's like, there's, you know, I joke and, um, like a lot of the college kids now and Deja and I had a running joke cause she was like posting stuff. She's like, why don't you post like clips about from Texas? And like, you do realize like we weren't on TV near as much as you guys, like we thought we were on TV a lot back then. Sure. It's nothing compared to now. Um, and so yeah, when it ran, I'm like, oh, well, here's some clips. So I would put a couple of clips on Instagram and Smart. tag Deja and be like, oh, here's baby cat. And she, oh my God. <laughs> but yeah, people don't realize that, yeah, you didn't see those. We weren't on TV that much. No, that's kind of what's kind of qu- crazy because people are like, man, I'd like to see some of the older games when during the summer when nothing was going on. And they, it's a Longhorn Network, to their credit, pushed a ton of your games, which was kind of wild that they filled out an entire day. Um, and, and from, I think, every year you were there, basically, that they, at least the games that were televised back then. Yeah, I think the only ones I – and again, because they're owned by ESPN. So freshman year, most of ours were on Fox Sports because that's who sure. the Big 12 had a deal with. Um, I would love to see some of those. I actually think I might have VHSs of them from my grandma, but getting those on DVDs and then watching them is a little bit of a hassle. But So there's a couple from freshman year I would have been interested to see, just to see what I looked like as a freshman again. But um, yeah, sophomore year, once we made the World Series, it, it's fun. It's fun to see all those games. Reach out to Scarborough. Amanda might have some games. I mean, every so often she pops up that game every year where you played against her. It was Texas, Texas A&M conference game. And she highlights that. I think because she won the game. That's why she keeps highlighting it. I could be wrong on that. She'll get, she'll get on me on that. But because you two go way back to like, what, high school? Houston days? Um, so we played against each other in high school. We played, we actually played her team, Magnolia, um, in a scrimmage before playoffs my senior year. And she didn't pitch, um, another pitcher threw. And then we actually began being friends um, her fresh, whichever, I think it was her freshman year, whichever year she got hit in the head and she was out for Big 12 tournament. And I just am not a social person. It like took everything I had to like say congratulations for winning player of the year and freshman of the year. And like, sorry, it happened. And she just was like, oh, thanks. And we chatted a little bit. And then from then on, we kind of just struck up a friendship and and we've been friends ever since for a while we were like going through the same things in life so you'll occasionally hear us call each other life twins um even as adults like we started dating my husband now her fiance you know we were building houses at the same time it was it's crazy um but yeah so we've had a friendship and yeah we share memories of playing each other watching each other play all that kind of stuff um but yeah she likes to play she likes to play the game that they win quite often, but there were more that I think we won. So yeah, I don't, I'll yeah. Have to find them. 
have to find those and play those. Yeah, you got to retaliate. You got to retaliate on her. But uh, that's true, though. You two are really tight. And I remember you were on the uh, their broadcast for the Texas fall ball game, and she was asking you questions. And you could tell you two could have gone for hours if you wanted to. Uh, so that that's awesome. Pretty cool there, broadcast. Last thing before we let you go. You mentioned you're going to do the podcast. You're going to be doing sometimes some interviews. You've yeah. been interviewed a lot. You got interviewed a lot in 2020 for various subjects, different matters, Olympics, softball, on and off field stuff. What is that like? Because every time there's a major issue, you're one of the people that people go to and say, hey, what do you think about this or that? So you've been interviewed a lot. I remember Mike Tirico interviewed you right after the Olympic postponement and things like that. What is that like being interviewed? On, and, and what do you take from that experience that you're going to apply to your podcast? Um, I think the biggest thing of, I like interviews when like questions that haven't been asked before get asked or they make me think, um, they're not like just the genuine, like, tell us where you started and what do you like about softball and things like that. Um, so I think, uh, I, I'm going to take those, those hard questions sometimes that make people think and then let people talk about, um, what they are passionate about. So like, I already know one of my first guests is going to be Haley McClenney because she is so passionate about just positivity in life, the way she approaches life. And I want her to share that piece with people. People know the stuff of piece, but I want them to know like that piece that she's super passionate about. Um, and I think that's where sometimes those pieces, people still value us as people, but they don't, they, they know that people want to know what we were thinking during the game and how we prepare for the game and how we do this. But it's like, sometimes that piece is so important into why they can be excellent athletes. And so um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to, when I do interview people, let them talk about the pieces that aren't the most obvious um, that make them who they are. Um, and then at the same time, um, just kind of dig a little bit deeper sometimes, um, be able to get out of them experiences that I know they went through because I've been part of it and let them talk about, you know, what they really felt and, you know, if teammates helped or whatever it was, um, and go that route. And, um, I've done it a little bit on Instagram with my pitching account, which I'll continue to do that into the new year. Um, but I really enjoyed having Allie Card on that and getting her to talk through being an alternate in 19 and then making the team in 20, because I was her roommate through the whole thing. And I got to see it kind of how she approached it and wanted her to be able to verbalize and share that. So other athletes know, like there's even elite athletes that don't make it and then figure out how to make it. Um, so it's, it's never an end all be all just cause you don't make something. Sure. Are you one that's going to kind of like to plan ahead the questions? Are you one that's going to ad lib questions? Like if you're interviewing me right now, could you come up with questions or you feel like you would have, you want to prep and kind of get ready for that, for that guest and, uh, oh. and touch topics. But I'm a little bit of both. So normally I have like three main, three or four main question topics and then okay. I'll be on their answer. Like I'll go in another route. Um, so if I was interviewing you, that would be easy. Cause the first one would be like, what is for you, what is the most important question or piece of information you feel like you need to get out of an athlete when you're interviewing them? Well, I think it depends on the, t the subject, you know, and the person and what they're up to. So it's a, what most, the most recent news probably is usually where I start with like, Hey, you're in the news for this. Like, I remember the first time when we had you on was a little bit after your comeback, but you never really explained your full story of what, how you came up to coming back to unretire. So that was, we started with that. So that's always like with a coach, for example, it's, Hey, how is your fall going? Things like that. It, a lot of it depends on the subject. And I'm sure you've picked this up. A lot of this too is from that point on, depending on how the subject answers the question, that might lead you into a different direction that you didn't even plan on going. Uh, so that's kind of, that's one of the things is, set the tone early with something that's kind of the main topic from that person. Why are they on there? What's, what's the, why are they, have they been in the news recently uh, and what they're up to right now that could be very significant. And I think that's something that uh, I've tried to take pride in. And every time we've had somebody on to kind of hit those bullet points, especially in the off season where I've had a lot of coaches that just got a new head coaching job. Like I had Golder on and I'm like, what, what's your vision for Western Illinois? What was it that attracted you about that job? And I think that's always kind of the first thing I want to set the tone with that guess. Yeah, I think you do a good job of that. I think the other thing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys do a really good job of not just being focused on like the main, I say the main schools, but like the top 25 and the ones that are always in the, in the news and the media. Um, and so I think sometimes I know for you, you probably have to go do a lot of research, but like, sure 
being prepared for the interviews for whether they're division two coaches, or I know you guys had, um, Wade Wilson on, right? Yep. Yep. From yep. Wade Wilson. Yep. Like, Texas Luther. To go do, do your research. So how much, how many hours do you put in outside of just recording? Well, it's quite a bit. Like the fortunate thing you can see, uh, for people watching this, this is my background of my house. So I don't have to go to the studio. I hopefully like you probably can record from your house too now, right? You don't have to go to a studio. So that's going to be a big plus. That's a big plus. So thank you for technology. Cause in our first couple of years, we did this, we had to do it in a studio. We had to, when is it available? When is it not? But like, there's a lot of research. Cause right. I don't follow Texas Lutheran softball as day to day as I would, you know, other programs. And you know, my co-host Vic obviously does a lot of D2 stuff cause he broadcasts D2. So that helps. But yeah, a lot of times it's just Googling stuff, writing the bio, reading some stuff and just kind of picking some things that, Hey, that's kind of interesting um, and see where the direction goes. One of the guests I had on recently was coach Asanio at Maris, who was a former major league baseball pitcher for the Yankees. Uh, and was there in 94, 95. So I was really riveted by like, how does a baseball guy now translate into softball coach and some of the differences there. So I try to pick out, you know, when I do the research, things that, you, like you mentioned earlier, that people don't really, it's not the common thing, right? Like, that gets talked about. Like, we had Coach Gump on, and I talked about uh, the Biggio family, who you're a big fan of. You're a big Houston Astros fan. They have a Biggio family in Notre Dame. You know, Calvin Biggio is with the Blue Jays, played at Notre Dame. So I kind of get into some different topics that the coaches uh, – kind of make them hopefully be inter interested. Because I always feel like if you show the guests you're invested in them and you've kind of done your work, they tend to open up more. Do you find that when you've talked to people the same way? Yeah. It's always nice when you know they've done their homework and they're not asking like, oh, so where are you from? Like Google. There's, there's this thing called Google. Um, or, oh, I didn't know you had two brothers. Google. I, I know. Or my webpage, either one. It'll tell you like most of my life. So yeah. When people have done homework, it's like, oh, I see you've done such, such, and such lately, or you posted on Instagram about this, like, let's talk about it. Um, then you know that people know, know, what, know what they're asking about and, know, and have a sense of who you are, um, which I think that's the biggest thing is having a sense of who you're interviewing um, usually helps put your interviewee at ease and allows them to, to be themselves and not feel like, okay, I'm having to tell this person what softball is, what my position is, like what I've done, like this is stuff you can already right. have found. Well, and, that, and you have that tough challenge because you're one of the faces of the sport. So a lot of times you're going to get that casual media that doesn't follow softball daily that doesn't know the game as well. So they're going to ask you the obvious question. So in your mind, you're like, oh, geez. But at the same time, you, under, you know that your responsibility is you got to represent the sport well. So even though the question has been monotonous, you still have to, you know, show the sport well because you're, try, you're provided a platform that a lot of softball people don't have. So it helps the sport. So that's kind of that kind of balancing act, right? That, that, that's the challenge. Yeah, it is. And, you know, you always want to answer – every request we can get because obviously the more softballs in the news the better but sometimes yeah you you sit there and you're like okay yep i'm from houston and let's go over this again um <laughs> what's the most popular question you've been asked the entire life what's the most like oh here we go it's coming like what's the one question you've probably been asked the most um it's a hard one uh I mean, I get a lot, well, I mean, first people, I get a lot of like, how tall are you? Because somewhere on Wikipedia, it was said I was 6'3 at some point and I've never been 6'3. <laughs> so I get, how tall are you? And then the next question is like, how tall is your family? And I go through that whole thing. And then everyone's like, oh my God, you're actually not the tallest in your family. I'm like, no, I'm second shortest in my family, to be honest. Um, but, and then I'm like, and this has anything to do with our interview, why? <laughs> um, that one, and then I just, I think that the overall, like, so what is it about pitching that you, you know, why, why, why did you choose to be a pitcher? Why did you choose to play softball? Because you're, you're, because you're tall. Like they would, so many people expect me to go play basketball and volleyball. And, and I did, um, but I'm like, sometimes you're just better at something else. And that's how life goes. I find it too. You like talking about your teammates more than even yourself. Like I remember we spent a good time talking about that Rockford team, which you don't get asked about uh, no, a lot, you know, right. About that, Rockford team. that Rockford team was so classic because on paper we were not supposed to win. Right. 
and it's just kind of wild, right? So that's always – you wish you would get asked more of that, but you're always you're – like, I think, like, the times we've had you on, we've barely talked about your Texas career because everybody always asks you about Texas. Yeah, everyone wants to talk about Texas, and then they want to talk about how many one, one nothing or one-run games we have. <laughs> Did they ask you about wearing shorts? No one ever asked about that. Okay, okay. But I didn't mind shorts. I still don't mind shorts. You would, okay, but so you would, if they went back to shorts. Apparently offensive players don't like shorts because you have to slide. So. That's true. I never had that problem. <laughs> That's correct. And you, you've made it record. You don't have any interest in hitting. So you've mm -hmm. always enjoyed – there you go. See, nope. that's good. That's good. See, so I like this. Well, you got what other questions you got for me? Um, well, I can't ask you who your favorite interviewee is because that's just not fair to everyone else. No. Um, but I think so. Who I can this one, who I guess who is your most interesting? Like when you interview, um, who intrigued you the most, or maybe went like directed the conversation another route because of their answers that you didn't expect? Ooh, uh, that, wow, you got me. See, you're good at this. So you go, you're, you got this down pat. Okay. Uh, so you've learned quick. That's a good question. Who, you know, the most recent episode, I had Taryn Papp on, who was on The Voice. Uh, I don't know if you watched The Voice or not a little bit, but she was on it. She's obviously the niece of Donna Papa, the North Carolina head coach. So that was interesting because we were able to talk about her music career and how she got into music and the comparisons to softball in that they both have to perform in front of people in an audience that people may not realize that, that you're, that you have that shared common thing that you're have to be accustomed to performing in front of people, which, you know, and how do you block that out? And so that was kind of fascinating to me with her recently about the kind of that comparison, because she chose to go music more than playing sports. Uh, also Danielle Laurie and just talking about how, her playing a bunch of other sports actually was – she liked that better than just playing softball exclusively, that she felt that made her a better softball player because she got that competitive juices going. I, I really enjoyed Danielle when we had her on a couple of years ago, kind of going a different direction uh, in that regard. And even somebody you know well, Beth, and how she's got into coaching and talking about, you know, her philosophy and coaching. That's always the thing that I always enjoy about the coaches is when they kind of open up how they got their start – and their philosophy and their opinions on the game. Cause a lot of times they get asked a very generic, Hey, how's your team looking for 20 tw this year? And what's the keys? And that's it. But they don't really like deep into like, Hey, what, what were you thinking when this happened type of deal? Yeah. That's cool. That's, cool. that's, that's pretty good. I got. That's, that's good. I got. No, that's good. You got this. I'm excited for your podcast. All right. So you're gonna have to let us know when this podcast comes out, I will. where will people be able to find it? I think it can, it's going to be on, I think Spotify and iTunes both. Um, okay. Are you going to be posting it on your all your social media platforms? Oh yeah, I'll post it as soon as it's it's up and going. Um, I'm supposed to make a phone call today, so we'll see. And you've got an Instagram. You mentioned a pitching Instagram. I do. I have a pitching Instagram. I started out really well with it. I had ideas during um, Athletes Unlimited that I kind of tapped into, but I'm going to try to make it more consistent um, come the new year where like Mondays are motivational quotes, Wednesdays are something, and then usually have an interview with a pitcher or a catcher um, eventually may go into hitters to talk about not hitting, but just like their, what they look at for pitchers and just to kind of give a, a different perspective, um, maybe coaches eventually, who knows. Um, but just, uh, it's just my way to kind of give little tidbits of, of pitching here and there to people because so many people have questions and, um, just trying to reinforce good good habits and good things and good good mentality um, for young pitchers and and just another way to kind of separate it from my personal fan page because as we mentioned generationally transcending I kind of there's a lot of fans that they don't want to see how you throw a curveball because you know they've been watching me since I played at Texas so they're older and throwing a curveball is not of interest to them so I made a separate pitching page for for pitchers to follow and be able to to learn some things from. Where can they find that uh, for those that are looking for those pitching ones? So that's um, on Instagram. Um, it's at, it's at CO8 pitching. Um, went ahead and adopted my number eight back. <laughs> um, but uh, so yeah, at CO8 pitching um, on Instagram. And that's the only place I post it right now. And um, yeah, so I'll be putting more stuff out there come the new year and a little bit more regularly. Well, we look forward to that. And uh, I always appreciate you coming on. This was fun. I always enjoy chatting with you and, 
I'm really excited about your podcast now. Now you've got the questions down. I felt, I felt a little heated, right? I felt like under pressure there. Like, oh boy, I better come. Now I know how the shoe fits on the other side. That's a, that's a good thing. Yeah, there you go. There Anytime you, go. you need, you need to, to be on the other side, let me know. We may have you just have you co-host with me or just fill in for me, period. Like you're all more than welcome. All right, we'll work on that. <laughs> Kat Osterman joining us here. Uh, Kat, thanks so much. Uh, good luck. We look forward to seeing you this year and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Appreciate it.